Snafu is a podcast that contains adult themes and language. Listener discretion is advised. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome to Snap Food, where the situation's normal, all fucked up. This is the podcast where we tell you stories of true crime, true mystery, and truly fucked up shit that happens to us every single day, and then we just forget about it, so we decide we remind you. I'm Shannon. And I'm Corey, and thanks for sticking with us, guys. Welcome back to another episode. We've been busy over here at Snap Food. Corey started school again. My uh, busy season at work is starting to get back into its its movement now that the Christmas break is over. But we wanted to keep doing this, keep coming out on time, keep telling you guys really spooky, scary stories. So yeah, we're doing a lot of a uh, lot of work now between Shan and myself. You know, we come home, doing a little bit of research, get some fun stories out for you guys, and I think we got some two really good ones today. Well, I don't know what Shan is all about, but. I'm assuming it's going to be a good one because her research is always spot on. Yeah, we decided that the theme for today's story was going to be gone up in smoke. So the two stories today are people who disappeared without a trace. And that's definitely what happens with mine. So that's going to be a fun one. And don't worry, we're not doing another witch one. This is not about magicians. We're not like that stupid. We're not going to make a silly joke like that the whole time. We are going to talk about two fantastically wealthy people who had every reason to enjoy their life and no reason to go missing. But before we get into that, I think what we're doing is we're definitely trying to get a hold of our listeners, and we've got a few suggestions to go back to another sports type of episode. So we're going to look into the world of wrestling and some other sports and across the globe to see what kind of weird and fucked up shit we can you know, discover to share some stories that you guys are kind of requesting. Yeah, we've got a lot of people talking about the wrestling story, and I'll admit that was really fun, and it seems like the whole world of wrestling is a really intense. Like, those guys in general, not just that they're actors and have a really interesting show that they do, but their background lives are nuts. Yeah, a lot of them, they come out of, you know, out of nowhere, and they get thrown into the world of wrestling, and it's just, it's interesting to see these stories, because, you know, if you look at football and baseball and basketball, they're coming up from schools, Or some minor league teams, but wrestling, they're just going to show up because they're some sort of mixture of an athlete and an actor. But, you know, now we have to think of something outside of wrestling, and so we need suggestions for that. We need to know what sports story you want to go into. I'm leaning towards football because those guys tend to be a little on the big sterity side but <laughs> i was thinking about doing something like western europe's basketball leagues where you know the washouts from the u.s go and why they're out there because... you mean go latvia yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> captain latvia and the uh, uh rigor hammer or whatever the hell they call it <laughs> okay well <laughs> you have fun researching that one and oh, go- yeah. putting that into google translate it's gonna I don't be a think... lot of translating and i don't speak i speak three words of polish and that's probably about as far as i can get onto those Slavic languages over there. <laughs> it has an X and a Z in it. That's going to be a no for me. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a no for me. Oh, we could do hockey. We could look at Canadian hockey and then just you would never be able to pronounce anyone's name. I know. It would be a hot mess. Yep. And also I'll end up making all of our Canadian fans like really mad at me because I won't stop making fun of them. I'm sure of it. Do that hockey. <laughs> do that hockey. <laughs> <laughs> But um, since we're not uh, we're not talking about Canadians, so we don't have to go guzzling down some syrup over here today. I, I don't know. Where's your lady from? Um, she's actually from Vienna, and then was in German or was in uh, Paris for a bit, and then we end up in the Galapagos. She's European. Yeah, she's one of those Eurocentric folks. Yeah. If she's born today, she'd be a Euro trash person. I'm convinced. <laughs> I got a I got a good old American boy. Well, and there I, you go. I'm kind of wondering if this is a story that everyone knows, but you know, I haven't heard a lot of people talk about it. Chancellor, I probably don't know anything about it. Okay. Well, let me let me get into it and. Forgive me, but I'm going to get a little dramatic because I like to tell a good dramatic story. Of course you do. Now, I think one of the scariest words that can be uttered in the human language is the word missing. Yeah. I mean, okay, think about it. Like nothing that goes missing is ever good. Right, exactly. (laughs) Right? Like no one's like, shit, my keys are missing and they're happy about it. Or that sock. It, yeah, it just means like we we have to admit to ourselves that something is gone and we don't know where it is. And what we don't know scares us. 
And, you know, like, again, like I said, if you, even if it's your keys, I think your heart races a little bit at the idea of losing your keys. I lose my keys while I'm driving my car sometimes. <laughs> so, like, if I'm getting ho- close to home or something like that, I tap my pockets and find my phone, find my wallet, and then I have no idea where my car keys are, but I'm in the car, so... But you know, it's something as simple as that is like, oh, shit, where's my keys? I'm going to be late all the way up to the point of like, oh, shit, who has my keys? Who's in my home or who might be in my car? You know, like the idea of of what could be missing and how bad that can get. It can really grow like an extent, like a substantial, substantial amount. Thank you. And the thing is, is like, I think what's even scarier to be missing. So if I said a person was missing, you'd probably think of a kid or an old person first. Yeah. Silver alerts and amber alerts. Yeah. yeah so those all over the state. Somebody, some of you guys might be a little confused. So we're both in Florida and this is one of those states, one of those areas that you will probably get more silver alerts than you actually do get amber alerts. And since the Amber Alert is a mass alert that goes out per county to alert people that a child has been abducted or is missing, you know, a silver alert is the same thing, but for older people. And I mean, I think I see a silver alert almost every day I drive on on I-95. Yeah, I think so, too. You see all the signs for those. They just tend to happen a lot because someone will get old and then drive and they might not, they're not supposed to be driving. or They get confused confused and lost. And then they end up in some sort of casino or sometimes it's worse like we've had old people with silver alerts but they just like walked off from a place and people found them in a bush like three days later yeah but i think we think about those people because they're they're innocent or they're more fragile than a grown adult who's capable of taking care of themselves alone yeah but then i started thinking about it and i realized like yeah of course those are terrifying those are innocents like you don't want anything that's innocent to get hurt but then what i think is scarier is the idea that like a competent human being could get lost. They could go missing. And that only scares you because what possible reasons could have happened? And none of them seem good. They never are. So I think it's stories like that. Like the stories like we're going to share today where the disappearances of the, of the people in the story have become so mysterious and they're so strange that we can't help but talk about them. Like even years later after it's happened, I mean, these stories start taking on a bigger than life theme. I mean, they're almost mythical and very possibly they're unsolvable at this point. Yeah, you get a cold case that goes on for too long and there's certain things that you'll never know. Yeah, and the more we talk about them, the more mystery that grows around it, the more that these people start to become like immortal. Yeah. Like we never forget them. Oh, it's like Amelia Earhart. Yeah, I mean, it's not like we're done searching for her yet, but... Today, I want to tell you about the disappearance of one of America's wealthiest heirs, Michael Rockefeller. That's a big name. Yeah, and I think almost every American at least should recognize the Rockefeller name, if not most people in the world. Rockefeller Center, New York City, if you don't know about that, well, then you've been living under a rock even more than I do. For like the last hundred years. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the Rockefellers are one of the wealthiest families in the whole of the United States. Starts with John D. Rockefeller and his brother, and they're it's an oil magnet. These guys made so much fucking money, it would make you sick. At one point, this guy, he ends up being worth around a net worth of over $900 million in his time's money. At his death in 1937, his assets equaled 1.5% of America's total economic output. Jeez. Yeah. The equivalent share today is about $340 billion. That's a lot of money. And, you know, they are considered the most powerful family in United States history. And the thing is, is like they haven't just disappeared. This family is still around. This family is still in business. They're still making money. They're just moving away more from the oil and and adding a lot more to like philanthropy and filling out other areas like banking and, and that kind of thing. And imagine all the possibilities that come to you when you're born into a family of this kind of wealth. I mean, you travel anywhere you want. You yeah. eat good all the time. You have the freshest clothes. You know, like everything. I think they've also got some mansions in Rhode Island. I remember that when oh, I was up there for a bit. They have so many properties. It's ridiculous. But, and that's, you know, that's the good part about coming from a family like that. Like everything's at your fingertips. Nothing's really that bad. I mean, the world is endless. And yet at the same time, families like that tend to have another downside to them so families like that have a lot of expectation to them 
Like a child who's built, like born into a lot of wealth like this, you know, you grow up, you should act right. You shouldn't bring shame on us. Maybe you should be working in the family, like company. Yeah. Or you should be doing this. Like there's always a plan. And sometimes everyone knows, like you're not always going to grow up to be what your family expected you to be. You know, that's a lot to hold to somebody. And, and that might not be what your heart's leading you to. But I don't want to get ahead of myself with that. I just want to say that this is the family that Michael's born into. And Michael ends up being the youngest of Nelson Rockefeller's children with Mary Todd Hunter. He's born a twin with his sister Mary on May 18th, 1938. And Michael grew up into a a really handsome young man. He's got his dad's square jaw. He's tall and lean. He has light hair that he comes back in a, a very slick 1950s style. And he's got these really cute thick Buddy Holly kind of glasses. Oh, God. Yeah, he's that kind of guy. So his family, of course, resided at a lot of, like, places, like we said. But for the main part, I believe that they lived in New York. So as he's growing up, Michael's whole life is just filled with watching his parents do their philanthropic, like, ideals. And they just have this love of art. Um, Some Saturdays, his dad would take him to auctions to find art for his collection. You know, it's not a bad Saturday. Yeah. I mean, he learned a lot about beauty and he learned a lot about worth and spent a lot of time with his dad, like bonding this way. But again, like many of the children of the extremely wealthy, Michael is sent to like all the best schools. So who knows how often he's actually spending, you know, time with his dad, because I imagine a lot of these private schools are kind of the more the time where you stay there. Yeah, they're more like boarding schools. Yeah, so he ends up going to the Buckley School in Manhattan, and then he ends up at the Phillips Executor Academy in New Hampshire. And although quiet, Michael, he's really bright, and he's fit, and while he's in school, he participated as a student senator, and he was a varsity wrestler. Hmm. So, I mean, as quiet as he is, he's no wallflower. Yeah. And then when Michael turned 18 in 1957, his parents would open the Museum of Primitive Art, and this was the first art exhibit of its kind for indigenous people to have their art placed on like a white pedestal with just a track lighting was just this is it like yeah. this is the beauty of it like before this anything that had to do with indigenous people was more of a mockery than less they would build like fake you know villages and just basically point out that european like centric people felt that the rest of the world were savages Right, you yeah, know, so Europeans were all that to themselves. Well, they just believed that they had, ex- like, exceeded the expectations. They were the top of civility and that the rest of the world was just savage or stupid. And, yeah. you know, oh, look at this rudimentary tool. Like, let's point out how how sweet this is. It's so simple. But it's not like that, you know. These people have their own culture, their own stories, their own art form, and they're making beautiful things. It's just not what we... It's just not what everybody sees as beauty. Yeah. But the lucky thing for us is that one of the wealthiest people in the world did feel like that was beauty, and that was the Rockefellers. And so this is what Nelson, his dad, said, quote, the first of its kind in the world. We do not want to establish primitive art as a separate kind of category, but rather to integrate it with all its missing variety into what is already known to the arts of man. Our aim will always be to select objects of outstanding beauty whose rare quality is the equal work shown in other museums of art throughout the world and to exhibit them so that everyone may enjoy them in the fullest measure. And as gross as Nelson Rockefeller ends up being, I kind of had a crush on him right there. Oh, did you? I, I mean, a man that's so wealthy, that's had everything handed to him his whole life, and he sees the beauty in something that's like a little bit simpler when he could have a Van Gogh or a Monet or, you know, he can have something from a great master and he realizes he does. Yeah. And a lot of people don't see that. So this museum, uh, this collecting and presenting, it, it really started like a spark in Michael. I think this is like something that would drive him in his future and in his whole life. But uh, first he has to go to Harvard. And, of course, being a son of a giant corporate family, he's expected to earn a degree in something that's going to help him to go on and help run one of the family businesses. Uh, You know, or that, or he's expected to go into politics like his dad. So, at this point, his dad is governor of New York. That's Yeah, because they were a big family up in New England from everything I remember. Like, them and the Vanderbilts. 
Well, his his dad and a couple other members of his family go on into, like, government. I think his, his dad really made the biggest splash by doing the New York governor thing. And then he ends up become he runs for president, but he is our 41st vice president with Gerald Ford. I didn't know that one. Yeah, we should, though. We're Americans. You yeah, should know I'm this. Yeah, shitty at that sort of stuff. And so, like, I think that's a lot. That's a lot of, for a kid to sit in the shadow of and be like, well, what the hell? I don't want to do any of that, but I got to do something. So when he went to Harvard, um, yeah, he ended up studying economics, but he also did a nod to his more creative side, and he also began to study history. I mean, so at this time when he's in college, his friends are saying things like, he's quiet, he's an artistic spirit. It's like someone like that, could you imagine him, you know, going into a Rockefeller company and trying to run that? And just, I just think it would kill his no, soul. Cause, like to me, those people that like the Rockefellers are, they stand for one thing, but then the artistic soul, like knowing you and how you do art all the time, they're, they're not compatible. They're two different things. Well, yeah. And that's exactly how Michael felt. And while he's in school, you know, He's not just learning. He's not just sitting at Harvard or partying. Like, he's starting to travel the world because he does have the funds to do it. And he's spending time in Japan. And then he goes and spends, like, time at at his family's ranch in Venezuela. So, like, he's starting to see more of the world. But he's falling in love with indigenous art in every place he goes to. He's starting to realize, like, this is what he'd rather do with his time. And then when he goes back to Harvard, he ends up meeting a filmmaker named Robert Gardner, who was at the time just beginning his work on the film Dead Birds. Okay. So this film was an ethnographic documentary about the Danny people of New Guinea, and it was being produced as part of a Harvard Peabody expedition in order to study the highlands in New Guinea. And it's it basically was one of the few remaining areas in the whole world barely touched by colonization or by Europeans. Hmm. Or that's what people would say, because the problem is, is that's not true. Yeah. I mean, the good part was, is that Europeans hadn't had their fingers all over them for as long as they had the rest of the world. But it happens that at the time that we're speaking of, New Guinea is considered Netherlands New Guinea. Really? Yeah, it's the Kingdom of the Netherlands had complete control of this region from 1949 to 1962. See, I, didn't, I guess I, I know that Netherlands had a lot of different lands, but I guess I never thought they'd own New Guinea. Well, even before that, it was uh, known as Dutch New Guinea. Uh, however, the, du- the Dutch had launched a, quote, police action in order to capture the territory from the Indonesian Republic during the Indonesian Revolution. So their tactics in order to take this land and their police action actually got them worldwide scrutiny uh, because they didn't do it real nice and there was a shit ton of violence. That sounds about right. But essentially, this whole area is is over 700 indigenous tribes who are just taken over by a group of white men that really they never see. Like, there's a couple places that they make, you know, the Dutch and... All of them make camp and they start building like their own villages, but they're not really traveling that deep into the interior. I mean, maps from this time, the interior of this area is completely white. They have no idea what's in there. Well, a lot of times it's because, you know, like if you look at the way certain areas are founded, especially the, if you look at the U.S., all of our, col- all of the old colonies, the, the, you know, 13 original states, they're on the coastline. And then you fill in the rest of that interior of the U.S., but... If you look at the population, we're around the Mississippi and we're around the three coasts, the Gulf, the Atlantic, and the Pacific. Yeah, you need water transportation. You're not going to go inland if you don't need to. And if you can get everything you need on the shore, there's no no real point to go inland. Especially because inland is thick jungle or, you know, like it's not like, oh, I'm just going to take the road through town and get to the center. Like, fuck no. Like, how are you you getting there? Gin and tonics, you're going to die of malaria. But what's crazier is like once they take over... They start implementing rules on people who have never fucking seen them. This is as good. Let me put it this way. Let's put it in a unique way that everybody can understand. This is like Earth. You, me, we're all Earthlings, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're from certain people. Yeah, your hero's already left. He's gone back to Mars. Yeah. Bowie's no longer here. So just Earthlings, right? You got the lizard people too, though. Look. The point is, is let's say that this whole fucking time, there's a huge group of aliens. And this whole time, they've been 
bitching back and forth against each other saying, no, I own Earth. No, I own Earth. And then one day they come here and they go, God, those fucking savages. But they really want Earth because there's something here. We're just a byproduct of it. There's that one movie where that is actually the big part of the story and they want to eat all the Earth people. But the point is, is how would how do you think Earthlings would take it if aliens came down and just announced, by the way, we took over Earth like 500 years ago and you're not allowed to eat fish anymore because that's bad and also no more kissing. Okay, you got it? Good rules. Bye. Good guns, aliens. No, my point being is like, yeah, you would not, who the fuck is this? Like, yeah. you don't know who these are. You know, you and suddenly they're just saying we basically own you. This is our land. Like no one that's on not earth. Gonna, that's not gonna go over well. This is how people of New Guinea feel. You're like a white guy shows up in the village and says, "By the way, I'm your boss, and you can no longer do your most you know basic cultural practices because we think it's yucky." Okay, good, you got it. Bye, and then you don't see them for like six months until they feel like you overstep some imaginary bound and they come back and they... And they come after you. Yeah. This is basically the world that these people are living in. They're walking on a very fine line because up until the Europeans start, you know, messing with their culture, this is a very rich culture of boat-living people usually who, you know, they have their own versions of art and they have their own songs. There are much, very many other indigenous groups where they don't write, but they have like a history of being storytellers. So they can tell you a story from 300 years ago and still give you such like little bits of like information that really happened because they've been retelling it for 300 years the exact same way. Like there's a lot to these people. And unfortunately, one of the things that they are really known for is headhunting and cannibalism. And we look at that today, and people looked at it back then and just thought, oh my God, that's 100% taboo. We don't do that. Like, you're crazy. No. Like, the moment they heard about it, no. But the thing is, is for these people, like, it's a way of life. Yeah. And this this will end up being a huge problem with Michael. But again, I'm still getting ahead of myself. So Michael signs on with his friend who's who's doing this movie, and he decides to be uh, the sound engineer. Okay. Before he manages to go to New Guinea with the whole film and everything, it gets a little fuzzy for a few years for me, but I believe Michael graduates cum laude from Harvard in 1960. All right. And then he does a six-month stint in the Army. I don't know how. I don't know why. All I do know, or let's say all I suspect, is that when you're very, very wealthy, I was just gonna say the military be... will either not let you join or they will release you because basically there's nothing they can really do. Like if you're that wealthy, like what can they do? Threaten to fire you, yeah. kick you out? And then there's what? also like you could become a liability. It's like why they didn't allow the um, they lost in 1776 the prince or whatever he was like a helicopter pilot or some shit oh the two princes are helicopter pilots and then when harry was over in afghanistan like they were specifically trying to target him like yeah that is a huge target something like that like i mean if you've seen iron man they kidnap iron man they hold him up for ransom you could do that with these industrialist come these industrialist families because they've got the money so either way he does six months and he's out and he gets back together with this guy who's making the film and And so in 1961, they take their expedition to, like I said, what's considered the Netherlands, New Guinea, and they're filming the Azmat people. And according to his tent mate, Carl Heider, Michael was, quote, very quiet and very modest. But I think the thing about Michael is is that he surprised everybody because everybody knows who he is and they know what he is. They know he's filthy, stinking rich. And yet... A lot of people said that Michael was really down to earth and really kind. And he was the kind of guy that got up earlier than anybody in the group. And by the time you got out of your tent, he was already out in the mud, like dirty head to toe, just working, just like an average guy. Um, He never complains and he just never acted like a spoiled millionaire's kid. Yeah, that's kind of a nice thing to see. And what's really nice, like I found a bunch of pictures, obviously. I mean, families like this, they love, they can, they have photographs, they have photographers, And everything I said about Michael was, yeah, he was really clean cut. I mean, basically Buddy Holly, but like cleaner. Yeah. And, you know, he he looked like a 1950s kid who smiled and I'm here in the family picture. And then you see him in 1961 and he's sitting in the dirt in a pair of jeans and a shirt. He's got his camera around his neck. His hair's growing out. You can see that beard starting. And he's got 
an actual fucking smile on his face. Like, for the first time in any picture, you can see this guy happy. And he's in the middle of nowhere, you know? And that's what you need. Sometimes, like, if you don't blend in or if you don't mix well with the family that you're in, once you get into your own element, everyone's so much happier when they're doing what they want to be doing. So while he's there with these people, he gets to observe, like, all, you know, they're, it's an ethnographic, like, video. So he gets to see all their their activities. He gets to observe feast. He sees intervillage fighting, um, which they're very big on their battles and their intervillage, like, warfare. Um, he gets to watch dances and songs. He even begins to learn their language, which has 17 tenses. Oh, that's not fun at all. Yeah, that sounds terrible. I think I deal with, what, three? <laughs> Overall, he's basically falling in love with a very spiritually driven culture that he just finds beautiful, even in its simplicity. And in a letter home, Michael writes, quote, Now this is wild and somehow more remote country than what I have ever seen before. Um, And basically, he's just a really happy guy to be there. And according to Gardner, the filmmaker, uh, Michael was, quote, witty, irrepressible, and a constant source of enjoyment. But... At this time in his life, he's now also a board member of the art museum that we mentioned before. And Michael has decided that he's got a new life goal. And this one is to bring a major collection to to New York. One so big, one unlike anything that's ever been done in a museum before. That sounds like the kind of guy he is, though. Like, if you've got the money and you've you've got the love for it, you want to do what you can to expose it to the world. Well, what he realized is he was in... A community of fantastic wood carvers who made beautiful pieces of art that no one in the world was ever going to see. And yeah, he, he had the means to collect it. So Michael got in touch with Adrian Gerbrands, the deputy director of the Dutch National Museum of Ethnology. And Gerbrands had recently begun field work in Azmet. Uh-huh. And so the Dutch New Guinea Department of Native Affairs also decided to send a government anthropologist, Renee Wassing, to provide Michael with assistance with this project. And so then all three of them decided to take their first expedition during May when they had a break in filming. By October 1961, Michael was ready to make a second expedition back to the Asmat people. While in Agates, Michael managed to get a Dutch patrol officer to sell him his homemade 40-foot catamaran. Wow. Yeah. I want a 40-foot catamaran. No, this thing is basically two dugout canoes with a hut placed on top of it and a little small outboard, like, motorboat well, that's the motor on the back. I mean, that's how they built their traditional, that's their traditional canoes. I'm just saying this is this is a homemade thing from a Dutch officer, and it, it works fine. So, on board, Michael loads this thing to the freaking gills. He's got it filled with steel axes. <laughs> Um, he's got fishing hooks and line, he's got clothes, he's got tobacco, because in the last 10 years, or in the last couple years since the Europeans have come, they've actually got most of these people addicted to tobacco now. It's a huge trading commodity. And again, this time with him is Renee, but uh, now they have two younger boys, uh, local boys, who are just like their assistants. And uh, over the next three weeks, the small crew managed to take this tiny boat and they go up to 13 villages acquiring art, just trading, <laughs> trading the steel axes, trading, you Tobacco. know, whatever. And in return, you know, he's coming back. And this is according to the Smithsonian. He's coming back with drums. He's got bulls, bamboo horns, spears, paddles, shields. I mean, there's a collection with his name on it right now, Metropolitan Museum of Art. And it's thanks to him that we have this collection at all. We have no other collection like this in the whole world, like, of this much art from the Azmet people, and it's all thanks to Michael. That's awesome. So he um, he takes all this stuff, he un- he offloads it, and then by mid-November, the small crew, they resupply for the next month, and they're going to head out and they're going to get more stuff. So on November 17th, the group set off to uh, go to Southern Azmet, and an area it's an area that hardly been touched by the outside world. And right now, the only white guy in the whole area is a well-known priest named Father Cornelius Van Kessel. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, oh, Van, Van Kessel or Van Kossel? <laughs> Kessel. Okay. And uh, he, he seemed to manage to integrate into living with the people there. In fact, I think he's, there's only two priests in this area right now. And one of them literally dresses like the indigenous people. He no longer wears like European style clothing. He's in like the loincloth and he wears bright feathers and, and ash. Like, he's styling. He really loves being around these people. 
And so Michael has a new goal. And and it's not just to keep collecting this art, but now there's a couple of pieces he really wants to collect. And a big one of this is called a bees pole. A bees pole. B-I-S. Sometimes it's B-I-S-J. Okay. But it's this... Is one, it's considered to be one of their most impressive types of artwork to be produced by the Azmet. And to top it off, they don't even keep them. Really? Yeah, this is something that's meant to be built, be beautiful, do its do its job, and then um, they take it and they let it return to the earth. So let me tell you a little bit about it. The poles are carved to commemorate the lives of important people who lived in the community. So usually people like the best warrior in the village. Yeah. And it basically serves as a promise that the person who it's sent to, like their deaths will be avenged. Because the feeling in this community and in this culture is that death doesn't just happen. Death happens because of war or death happens because of something spiritual that we can't see but it, it's a spirit or something causing that death. There's a reason behind death. Right. And so when somebody dies, they believe that it's, it off balances nature. Like something is now wrong. And in order to correct this, we need to make it right. And, and to do that, we need to kill. We need to avenge that death by killing another. And so this is where that head hunting comes in. Okay. So the Azmat people would usually have these rivalries between these other tribes and it would almost be like a tit for tat like revenge killing so you know this person would get head hunted and then in a few months somebody else might have gotten head hunted and then eventually when the numbers finally like got up there both groups would kind of say yes we have come back to balance again we're okay and there would be this huge feast like a biz feast to celebrate you know bringing together like the balance and then the biz pole would help the spirit of the person that it's dedicated to to travel into the spirit world okay and so after all this would be good after the after the fe- the feast after helping the spirit move on they would take these giant poles which are 20 they can get up to 25 feet tall Jeez. they would take them out to the sago palm groves and then they lay it out there so that it could just degenerate and just fall back to the ground But these things, like I said, they're 25 feet tall because what they do is they take mangrove trees, they take one tree, they turn it upside down. They find one of the roots that's basically sticking up and they make these beautiful interwoven like carvings of people and crocodiles and and the people are supposed to resemble the person it's after. So like they're all tweaked a little bit. They're all special. And at the bottom of these even has a receptacle to like receptacle to hold um a human head oh that's not unsettling at all well i mean like i said this whole thing has a purpose right yeah but at the same time it's beautiful i mean this is it's a master carving piece of work and yet for the most of the world nobody would ever seen it because it's supposed to go into the grove and it's supposed to take all that energy that you put back into it and put it back into the ground to nurture the community and that's Michael's goal, is to take this 40-foot boat and go get some of these 20-foot poles. And he also really wants to get like him... that's going to be a bad idea if I'm going to try to take these. <laughs> he also really, really wants to get some of the decorated skulls from the, he- yeah, that's, the yeah, head hunters. Uh-uh. I'm okay with the rest of everything he wants to do, but there are certain things that photos are probably just good enough. Right? But I don't know. I guess I, I, I mean, maybe I see there's a certain he's... point where you just get too deep into your own like collection that you're it's, like anything, it's everything. anthropology I'm... and archaeology and ethno whatever. So I see where he's coming from. But there's certain things that you just got to leave, I think. Well, I don't know if this was a rumor or if it was true. But the rumor was that he was offering 10 steel hatchets for one head. By now, headhunting had been strictly forbidden by the Dutch government, like we said, And this actually ended up causing a lot of trouble, him asking for these heads because the tribesmen really wanted wanted those steel hatchets. So they literally went to the country officials and people were asking for permission to do another head hunt. Hey, can we kill that guy, please? Yeah, basically to quote, for one evening only, please, sir. Oh, that's called the purge. Yeah, we have that (laughs) in America. So the crew left on the 17th. Uh, like I said, they're intending to motor down the Arafu Sea coast, and 
basically as the catamaran begins to cross the mouth of the Betched River, they end up hitting a conflicting tide and tide and winds start causing all these waves and cross currents. Basically, they went from a smooth river into a fucking washing machine. Yeah. They're all over the place. That'll happen. And unfortunately, the outboard motor ends up getting flooded. So now they have no motor and it seems like they don't have like actual paddles or anything because they're just floating now. Mm. And then it gets worse because they get hit by a wave and the entire thing capsizes. Yeah, that's and it's a catamaran. That's not a good thing. If, no. you're, if you get a catamaran to flip, you know you've done something wrong. You're not getting it back up. No, 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 you're not. Well, after the the thing capsizes and the four guys fall overboard, Renee and Michael end up clinging to the hull of the boat. But the two local boys, they just grab some what they call jerry cans and they go swimming and make it to shore. They just leave them. I probably would have too. Yeah, I, I, you know, there's no word I can say on that one, so I just kind of gave a head tilt, but yeah. Well. At certain points. Un- unknowingly to Michael or Renee, who are still back at the boat, the two boys do make it to shore. They end up walking for hours until they get back to Azmet, and then they tell everyone what happens, and they go get the government officials, and um, searches began immediately, but... Michael and Renee ended up clinging to that the hull of that boat overnight. Michael managed to get a few minutes of sleep because he tied one of those jerry cans to his belt. And it helped him stay afloat for just a few minutes while he like closed his eyes. While they're sleeping on these boats overnight, the Dutch colonial government is scrambling, you know, search parties. They got ships out there. They have planes and helicopters. And I think they have even over a thousand local tribesmen in their canoes and huh. doing a search. And um, by morning, Michael looks at Renee and he's figured we've just been drifting. And he finally tells Renee that he's afraid that they're going to get pulled out to sea and that's going to be it for them. And so he tells Renee that he thinks they they should both try and make a swim for it. He thinks it's somewhere between three and ten miles back to shore. Oh, I would drown and die. Well, that's what Renee thinks, too, because Renee's like, hell no, I'm not a strong enough swimmer. I think we need to just stay here. And Michael just looks at him and says, I think I can make it. So... Eddie would go. Eddie would go. Um, We got to do an Eddie story. Yeah, we'll do an Eddie story, (laughs) but... Okay, so by 8 a.m., Michael strips down to his underwear. He ties his glasses to his neck. You know, you know what you would do. You got glasses. Yeah. uh, You lose that, you're screwed, right? No, I would... Yeah, I'd die. He also takes two more of the jerry cans, the gas cans, empties them, and he's got those tied to his waist, too. And... You know, he takes one last look at Renee and says, I think I can make it. And that's the last time anybody can positively say they saw Michael Rockefeller ever again. Renee said that he watched his head bob for like another half hour and then he was gone from his sight. That afternoon, Renee was spotted from the air and then he was rescued by the next morning. And by the time he got rescued, he was 20 miles offshore. Jeez. Yeah, that's um, a long way to swim. That's a hell of a long way to swim. So, meanwhile, obviously, the Rockefeller family has already been notified uh, that their son is missing. Like, this is not one of those missionaries that, you know, the government's going to hush up and not tell anybody. Right. This is a fucking Rockefeller. So, Nelson and his daughter, Mary, who's Mike's twin sister, they charter a plane and they headed to Marowak, which is 150 miles southeast of Azmet. So the whole time they're there, father and daughter, they're riding along in a bunch of, a bunch of planes. They're looking through binoculars. They're just trying to find Michael. But the problem is, is like you're looking for a needle in a haystack. Uh, you're looking worse than that. Yeah, you're looking for a little speck in the ocean yeah. or maybe something along like the marshes covered in driftwood. Like it, it's almost impossible. And honestly, I think a lot of the people who were doing the search started with almost no hope. Yeah, I mean, at that point, even with airplanes nowadays, we lose fucking airplanes, and we have all this technology to find them, but finding one person who swam somewhere, hopefully in the right direction. Right? You know. And So the one positive to this was that officials did agree. They said if Michael made it ashore, then there was a good chance he survived. Yeah. But the problem is, is, like, does he make it to shore? This, This whole water is infested not only with sharks, 
but saltwater crocodiles who go up to like 20 feet long. And krakens and... I mean, just, no, I mean, but seriously, that's, I mean, I've been no, swimming I... in the Keys and there's signs about saltwater crocodiles and I have a bigger fear about those things than I do, like, sharks. sharks well, sharks understand you're not a fish. Sharks understand that you're not easy. Yeah. They are fucking bottom feeders. They want something dead or dying to fall into their mouth and they're just going to keep going. Like, a lot of work is not in their best interest. Or they want a seal. However, a crocodile will fucking drown you and shove you in its little hole and save you for later. Yeah. So they terrify me. Fucking dinosaurs. <laughs> they are. They haven't had to change for like two million years. Because they're perfect. The only thing they could change into is Godzilla to make themselves better. Uh, meanwhile, Father Gerald Heckman uh, of, of the Evangelical Aid Mission... He was offering a reward at this point of axes and tobacco to anyone who brought Michael's skull. Oh. So that's how quickly, like, people have already jumped to, I don't think he's alive. Yeah. But I do want proof that you had him. By the 24th, and remember, they went out on the 17th and capsized on the 18th. Yeah, it's... By the 24th, the Dutch minister told the New York Times that there was no longer any hope in finding Michael alive. By November 28th, his sister and his mom and his dad returned home. But, I mean, at this point, you have to realize, like, I'm not actually doing anything. Nothing that I can do is going to be beneficial in finding yeah. him. Yeah, I mean, you've got, like I'm saying, you got a body who has zero way of being tracked at all through 20 feet or 20 miles of ocean, no matter what way he's swimming. Even if he's swimming the right way, he can get drifted out, take a wrong turn, or it's hard to navigate when you don't have any kind of tool. It would take another two weeks before they finally called off the official search for Michael. That's not to say that searching for him didn't actually continue. People were always looking out for Michael Rockefeller. Yeah, of course. Government officials were trying to find him. It just was no longer an official search that required... And a priority. Yeah. it's Searches cost money. Cost manpower. And it's just, you know, at some point when you're not even finding a shred of of anything to prove that they've ever been there you just have to stop yeah so and and that just leaves us like i said there's no proof there's no evidence that michael ended up anywhere and yet we start having all these crazy theories and stories come out about what could have possibly happened to michael and honestly each one gets crazier and honestly a little bit more convincing as they go so of course like we said maybe he drowned that's one of the most likely ones of all. It yeah. seemed like he was a good ways off ashore. I don't think at the time he took off that it would have been 20 miles. I think it would have been closer to three to five. But yeah. that's still, that's still a, a really thing, difficult swim, even if you have those floating containers to help you. And who's to say how far you're drifting? And especially with those floating containers. They could easily, if, you, if the current's gone the one way or the wind changes, they're going to take you. They're going to make you float easier and just go with it. Yeah, he could end up anywhere. And yeah. honestly, that's why a lot of people think he just drowned or, you know, a shark got him or a crocodile got him. Because, like I said, I'd argue that anything would go after a healthy man except for at this point if he's holding on to two containers trying to waddle his way into shore maybe he does look like a a hurt fish he definitely isn't going full speed yeah all right so ideas after that just start getting more wild so we start getting third and fourth hand accounts of michael being alive uh that they're spreading from village to village Rumor was that Michael managed to swim uh, about three and a half miles to shore and then found himself abducted by the group on the coast who were basically unapproachable, especially at the end of the Dutch regime. So these people had barely had any contact in the first place. And now that the Dutch regime, like, literally had no more control on them, like, they weren't taking... Yeah, they're not, de- they're not dealing with anybody. Yeah. So the reason that this story draws any kind of water to it is because this is actually a habit of the Azmat people. They like to adopt unique or strange-looking people. Oh. Yeah, and this has actually happened in their history with World War II Japanese soldiers who were on the island. Really? Yeah. So, according to the Azmat, odd-looking or unusual people offer protection against forest spirits. And that's, like, one of the biggest, like, cultural beliefs that they have is, you know, they're part of the wood. They're part of the the forest. And with that comes spirit demons, Mm -hmm. you know? And strange or unique people protect them against it. So what these Japanese soldiers tended to become were prisoners slash guests. 
you, they took care of them, they clothed them, they fed them, I, they intermarried with them. You just couldn't leave the village. Right. You can't go out that way. You're here now. We have proof of these people, however, because some of them took the opportunity during some of the inter-village rivalries and battles to take the confusion and run away. All right. But a lot of them stayed. A lot of them were fine They're with marrying not, in. Probably not mistreated, I'm assuming. No, I mean, they were just, uh, shit, here's your wife and some food. You want to leave too? (laughs) You know, like, the Japanese weren't supposed to give up until they were told to, like, come home or you were really supposed to die on your sword. I think I'd be like, you know what, I'm going to stay here. I saw that episode of Archer where that guy still thought the war war was going on. Oh, man, that really happened too. But that's for another time. That's another story for another time. This obviously still seems far-fetched for the theory for Michael Rockefeller, except for in 1968, a man calling himself John Donahue walked into the office of the Argosy magazine and demanded to see the editor. According to Donahue, he claimed that he was a gunrunner and a professional smuggler and a wanted criminal. And on his most recent operation, 10 weeks earlier, he and two companions stopped at a small island called Kanabura, and there he claimed he met a half crippled white man with long sandy with a long sandy beard whom the village was keeping in their um in their tribal council house. All right. And so Donahue then claims that the man peered at them as if he was nearsighted because he like squ- squinched in his eyes cuz he couldn't see cuz he doesn't have his glasses. And um and then he says that the man said, "I'm Michael Rockefeller, can you help me?" Oh, jeez. Yeah, but supposedly uh, Rockefeller described tipping over in the boat, swimming ashore, and then spending three days stumbling through the mangroves. He said he slept during the night in the trees and that one of the branches happened to break underneath him and he ended up breaking both of his legs and losing his, his glasses. He says after that, he was captured by a party of Trobrian Islanders and they brought him back home and kept him believing he was an important sorcerer. Donahue then claimed that he never did anything in order to help Rockefeller because at the time his activities were incredibly illegal and that might cause him problems. Yeah, that'll do it. But if there's a guy that you think you could help, I mean, there are certain points you have to drop what you're doing. The reason I call bullshit on this one is I don't care how illegal your activities are. You if help. you know where the richest man is yeah, you'd help the being captive, you're going to go to their family and you're going to say, give me a fucking million dollars and I'll get you your kid. Yeah. I, I mean, they're not going to turn you in. So, I call bullshit. I agree. Then, a book uh, by Paul Tuohy came out in 1979, and he suggested that Michael's mother had hired a private investigator, and he's convinced that she paid this guy $250,000 for three skulls from the Azmet people that claimed to be the only three white men they'd ever killed. Hmm. This has never been verified. This is not something the family talks about. In fact, after the search was called off... And people st- kept trying to ask the Rockefellers about Michael, kept questioning about this for the next couple of years. Like, they shut this down. They basically said, this is family business. We think, you know, we'll just leave him be. Like, let his spirit rest. Like, we're not, we don't want the public to be a part of this anymore. Yeah, I know. And so, we'll never know. Maybe his mother did do that. She most certainly had the funds and the means to do it. And if so, maybe it brought her a little sense of peace. You know, if she thought she had her son's skull home. But I mean, that's the same thing. That's why we bury bodies even after like they've fallen in combat or something like that. It brings peace to the, the living. It brings peace to the living. And sometimes a lot of people believe that your spirit never rests until you come home. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a very plausible one to me. And then we finally have another explanation of what happened to Michael in a book that just came out in 2014. And it's by Carl Hoffman. And this is actually something that the Smithsonian almost quotes for like pages on. So we're going to have to go dive back just a little bit into history to understand why somebody would hurt Michael. And that's what this guy thinks. Carl thinks Michael was murdered. But now we have to go back four years before Michael even got to New Guinea. And that's 1957 when two tribes with over 124 men, um, they decided to go on a trip together. They were going to go up down the coast and collect dog's teeth. Okay. And this was something that they were going to use both spiritually and as, like, money. Unfortunately, the initial inviters, the tribe that invited the other tribe to come with them, then turned on 
these people while on board a boat and basically a huge battle royal just broke out on board. And in the end, out of 124 men, only 11 men came home. Hmm. But again, this is, this is inter-tribal. This is how they live. This is what they do. So it was just a way of life. It's just the nature of, of the, of the people that way. Right. Unfortunately, that's not how the new Dutch government felt about it. Of course not. They felt like they had made rules that somehow these people should have known about, and they crossed that line. Oh, our law is that you might not fully understand. Exactly. Oh my god, I have a quote you will not believe. But look, the, the, the new Dutch government controller, Max Lepre, he doesn't give two shits about these people. He yeah. is an old school, you know, colonizer. Like, he's just... He feels that what these people just did was a slap in his face and a stain on his career. He didn't care that they died. He didn't care that, you know, people lost their lives or how this might affect a village. Like, he cared about how it looked on him. Right. So he decides he's going to teach them a lesson. And that's to quote him. He feels he needs to teach them a lesson. Hmm. So on January 18th in 1958, he leads a force of armed officers to Omadessa. All right. Omadessa. And that's one of the groups. And basically, that's the group that instigated the fight. And so what he decides to do is confiscate every weapon that they have and burn all their canoes. Oh, yeah. That's going to go real well. By the way, these people are hunter and gatherers. You just destroyed all their means of providing food for all their families. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Really super awesome. And then Max felt like... With the other group, in order to make everything right, well, he offered them a Dutch flag. Because that should, you know, Dutch flag and some steel axes. Yeah. 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 Everything's cool now, right, guys? Yeah, that's not how you do it, buddy. So, this group of people looks at Max like we would look at the aliens, and they basically say, we don't know who you are, and we really don't give a shit, so here's your stuff back. Please leave us alone. Like, that was their intention. Here's your stuff. Go away. away. Max felt like, here's my stuff. These people want to fight, and they're possibly violent. He literally, like, always takes the worst look at these people. He treats them like savages who want to murder him because at night, he's really scared of it. I Yeah. Like, that's just... No, he's in a strange. He's a stranger in a strange land, is what it comes down to. Yeah, and he basically hates these people. Yeah. So Max decides again, um, since they're you know so clearly intending him violence, he needs to go set this right. Mm. So on February six, he takes an armed guard again. Great idea, and he heads out to this village. Well, obviously, this village already heard what happened to the other village. You came in there, and you burned all their canoes, and you took all their weapons and their whole way of living. So when Max arrives with his police force, all he finds are men. Right. There's they're, no, ready to go to, they're ready to defend themselves. They're just ready to see what's up. But there's no women. There's no children. There's not even a dog out. These hmm. people have, like, they've secured their family So that if anything bad happens, they can go away. But of course, the moment Max sees this, he thinks, oh my God, they're going against me. Something's up. And so he looks around and he sees one group of men to his right. He looks over, he sees another group of men to his left, and they're just holding their bows and arrows, spears and and like... um, Shields? Shields, yeah. And, and But see, this is a something that they probably would have just had around. And you just showed up with guns. Yeah. And so as he's looking between these two groups and starting to panic, all of a sudden a a third group of men behind another set of houses starts to dance. And of course, Max refers to this as a warrior's dance. So he he feels that they're preparing for war. Unfortunately for everybody involved, one man inside one of the huts decided to come running out. He had something we don't know what thing in his hand max felt as if he were coming towards him and the police officers started shooting started shooting this is a group who had probably almost never even seen white men yet alone a gun bullets they fight with bow and arrow spear and shield yeah now you got thunder boomsticks yeah well in a matter of minutes five men are dead in the village 
And out of those five men, four of them are some of the most important people in that village. It's their top warriors. I mean, the problem is, is this had never happened. This was so incredibly violent. It happened so quickly. And then five people. I mean, if you only have a village of a thousand people and five people die, you know who those people are. Yeah. And another thing about this is that these are people, like I said, that they pass stories down from generation to generation. Yeah. This this act was so violent that even today, I'm sure you could go there, but it very well, at least like 10 years ago, people went, asked them what happened, and they described bullet for bullet where this person got hit, how he was injured, what, I mean... That is so ingrained into their people's history now. Yeah. And let me say, it did not go over very well. Oh, I doubt it, yeah. In the panic, everybody in the village, you know, five people are dead, everyone else takes off running into the jungle. To them, it's a massacre. Right, yeah, I mean, that's... And the noise and the the new weapons, that's something they've never seen before. And you know what Max had to say about it? Oops. No. Uh, Max said, quote, The course of affairs is certainly regrettable. But on the other hand, it has become clear to them that headhunting and cannibalism is not much appreciated by a government institution all but unknown to them, with which they had only incidental contact. It is highly likely that the people now understand that they would do better not to resist authorities. Mm. He literally just admitted that these people almost have no contact uh, with these yeah. like white people, and that they don't even know the fucking rules. But damn it, they certainly learned a they lesson need to about all my law. Yeah, I taught them about things that they weren't doing in front of me. <laughs> you know, like like what a fucking asswad. Yeah. God, what a piece of shit. Ah, uh, fuck you, Max. All right, so. You're like, great, that was a neat story. What the fuck does that have to do with Michael? I was, yeah, I was just about to say that. Okay. That was before. That was four years before Michael comes to New Guinea, right? He comes to New Guinea, does his trip, boat tips over. So it just so happens that, according to the Catholic priest, Von Pige, that had been around the Azmets back then, the one of the two, Yeah. Um, the day that Michael had set out on his catamaran, 50 men from the Ochenep village had brought palm building supplies to the government post. So what they had done is they had left during the night, traveled overnight, stayed in the village all day while they traded, and then they were going to come back that night and get back to the village. Right. So around dawn on the 20th, they paused at the mouth of the Etwa River because they were waiting for the tide to turn, something it didn't seem like like Michael and the other guy kind of did. And so while they're waiting, everyone's, you know, they start to have a smoke. Some of them are eating. They're just dicking around until they can go when they see something move in the water. So at first they think crocodile. And then they look and they're like, white man? And so they literally found a white man in his underwear swimming on his back. And when he saw them, he waved. Oh, boy. (laughs) Obviously, everyone's just fucking stunned. This would be like you and me seeing a pink elephant walk down the street. Like, yeah. what the fuck is that? <laughs> and at us. So, meanwhile, on board, a fight breaks out, right? Um, you got one guy, he stands up and he tells everyone on the boat, you're always talking about headhunting twans. It's just like their word for white, white people. Okay. Um, well, here's your chance. Oh, boy. And the thing is, is again, this only happened four years ago. And this is a culture that believes in, in death, not allowing somebody to rest and allow the community to just be normal until it's been revenged. Yeah. I mean, in their idea, until those deaths are revenged, those spirits are causing illness and bad mm. luck in the village. Yeah. And so everyone's probably been talking for the last four years about how they wish they could get, you know, revenge on those awful white men that came in. But it's talk. Yeah. You know what I mean? So the one guy yells out, well, here's your chance, and they all break into a fight. So some of them agree. Fuck yeah, let's do it. We have our chance. Yeah. Some of them are like, are you fucking nuts? You can't just kill a guy swimming down the river in his underwear. Kill a random white guy. <laughs> Where'd so he come from? Two men grab Michael, and they start to pull him into the canoe, maybe to save him. However, a man named Pep ended up spearing him in the ribs. It wasn't a fatal injury, but that kind of made everybody's mind up. And so the group then rode to a hidden creek, which was the Jawar River, and they killed him. 
Mm. Supposedly, uh, his head hung in the house of a man named Finn. And his thighs had been turned into daggers. Um, his tibia into points for fishing spears. In the end, over 15 men had bones from whoever this man was. Yeah. And funny enough, they even had a pair of underwear and they had a pair of glasses. So, like I said, the, pr- the priest ended up hearing these stories. And he found this out about a month after Michael's disappearance. So after finding this out, he wrote the controller in a letter that said that he had heard about it. But at this point, quote, it is certain that Michael Rockefeller was murdered and eaten by Oshinep. And in the letter, he literally names names. He says what parts people have and he says who has them. This letter goes up to the government. And on December 21st, the governor of uh, the Dutch New Guinea cabled the Minister of the Interior with notes that it was secret and that it needed to be destroyed. But Hmm. parts of it remain in the, like, files even today. Yeah. And basically it outlines both priests saying the same thing, that, you know, he came in, they they found him, they killed him, and they headhunted him, like, they have his head. And after relaying that information, it finally said, quote, in my opinion, some reservations need to be made. No evidence has been found yet, and therefore there is no certainty yet. In this connection, it doesn't seem germane to me to give information to the press or Rockefeller Sr. at this time. So they hid that information from everybody. Of course. The two priests claimed that they felt certain that the story was true, and they really wanted to contact the Rockefellers and let them know what they had found out. But the church denied them. The church warned them against telling them what they had discovered and said that the issue was like a cabinet of glass and that the priest should remain silent so that the mission will not fall from grace with the population. Mm. And then Father Von Kessel was returned to Holland. Oh. See. They don't trust him much, huh? Right. So the church was in a really big need to try and convert all these poor, poor souls away from their savagery over to Christianity. And gosh darn it, it just wasn't worth, like, digging up old shit and making people feel bad because it might keep them from coming to God. Yeah, exactly. And you got to make sure you convert everybody. Right? You know, wh- that guy's already dead. Who cares? The other problem is the Dutch government... Um, so they claim they send an officer to do an investigation. And in fact, it's the same officer that sold his fucking boat to Michael. He gets out there. He does a three-month investigation. And he hears all the same stories. And he eventually asks the guys, like, can you tell me did this happen? And he says that they admit, like, yeah, that's exactly what happened. And he says, look, I can't do anything without proof. Like, can you show me some kind of proof? Yeah. And he says that the men took him out into the jungle to, like, a muddy area, dug a hole, and... And in it were some bones and a skull. The skull had no lower jaw, which was something that happened when you head hunted. Like yeah. a, if you found an ancestor's skull, it should have the jaw. It should be decorated. It should be beautiful. If you found a head hunted skull, it's not going to have its jaw to it. Right. It's going to be just destroyed. Right. But also in the skull was a small hole in the right temple. So maybe how he died. The officer then claimed to have handed over the remains to the Dutch authorities. But according to him, he was never asked to write anything there Hmm. was no report there was no like research into it um they pulled him out and that was kind of it and the fact is is the dutch were literally about to lose control of half of new guinea at that point anyways they had zero interest in the in looking for rockefeller anymore and they certainly didn't care about calling up a couple guys on headhunting they were busy just trying to keep their country which they didn't right yeah And what's even harder about this story is, like, I don't know that we'll ever find the truth. Because the guy that went there and wrote this book in 2014, you know, he even admits, look, these people are scared. They're really scared to admit that anybody killed Rockefeller because at this point they're worried that it's going to come back on them. And so to go into any of these villages, you're already an outsider. Now you literally walk up to somebody and say, hey, who killed this guy? You guys, right? Did you guys do that? It's not going to work out. And at this point... Like, if Michael did get captured, I bet he's long dead. Somebody would have found him by now. Oh, someone definitely found him. <clears throat> and if that other that one story about him being that, like, cripply guy is true, then, I mean, he was how old in the 60s? Like... He was only 23. Yeah, still, you're B80. I mean, he could be alive, but if he would survive something as bad as, like, getting both your legs broken and you being just 
kept in a, a tribal house, like, I don't think you have a very good long life ahead of you. Yeah. All I can hope is, is now that we're starting to do all this DNA testing, just maybe, maybe somebody with the Dutch government could find that skull and bones. Because yeah. it went somewhere. Or maybe his mom really did the, get the skull. And maybe the Rockefellers already have their answer. Maybe. Either way, I just wish that this didn't happen to Michael. He seemed like a really happy guy who was just trying to share just, yeah, like something exactly. beautiful with the world. Yeah. And I don't know if we'll ever know. That's the hard part about some of these stories. So um, mine kind of has a similar, obviously mine's going to have a similar ending, but mine also has a, a lot more of a messy beginning than yours does. What? So Can it get messier than going into the middle of nowhere? Well, the, the beginning is like, all right, so I'm going to be bringing us to the Galapagos. So we're still in the Pacific Ocean, but we're kind of more close to the equator. Um, you know, about, what, 900 or 600 miles, 900 kilometers off of the coast of Ecuador. So we're right at the equator. And everyone knows the Galapagos for Charles Darwin and the second voyage of the Beagle, where he goes and does his finches and he writes up about sea turtles. evolution. And then there's, they're uh, tortoises, they're land tortoises. And it's hot. Galapagos tortoises. Yeah, and it's very hot. But we're not talking about, like, the 1830s and 40s of when Charles Darwin was in the Galapagos. We're going to kind of jump forward to the 1930s of the Galapagos. Now, we're going to be discussing, by by the time that the story has happened, just so we're kind of all on the same page, the Ecuadorian government have tried to have, hi, cat, (laughs) um, they've tried to have people settle in Ecuador, on the Galapagos Islands, to see if they can get some sort of colony over there and over the course of time people have gone over they've brought cattle they've brought dogs they've brought cats they've brought um pirates will leave goats there and then because the goats were there the ecuadorian government brought dogs to take care of the goats and then everyone shows up and they bring whatever and accidentally mice and cockroaches get brought over because yeah they come on everything yeah so then they bring cats to handle that um, and then the cats eat the birds. And then the cats eat the birds, and, and it's then just the dogs all eat the cats. a giant disaster. But, um, you know, people are looking at the Galapagos a lot of times, and especially because of Darwin. You're getting some birds, and you're getting some, like, really long-lived tortoises. But that's not what the Galapagos is going to look like for this for the sake of this story. This is the 1930s, and we're going to be discussing the Baroness de Bosquet. Now, Bosquet here is spelled kind of like Bosquet, but it's French, so it's Bosquet. De Risquet. Huh? <laughs> the Duchess de Risque? Yeah, essentially. Um, that sounds like a really good like drag name. It probably is somewhere. <laughs> I'm sure if we go back down to Key West, we'll find it. Now, Baroness de Bosque here is quite the character. Her story, it, I dug for hours trying to get a little bit more of a be- beginning for her. The only thing I really know is that she's from Vienna. And she's either a spy or a secretary during World War One. You know, the Great War. Yeah, because what else was she going to do? Right, one I mean, or the other. you've got spy or secretary. They're so close that <laughs> you might as well just, if I can do one, I can do the other. It's just a little added shorthand. <laughs> Knowing her, she's probably the secretary, but telling the spy stories. So we'll get to that in a little bit. The Baroness, she is a Baroness by marriage. She's been married four times between... You know, by 19th, or she's born in 1887-ish, so the late 1880s, she's born. By 1934, she's been married and divorced four times. Oh, wow. Her first one was to um, Baron de Wagner, who's a German... Um, baron? He's a German baron, and then, yeah, and then... That's like my new dream now. I always wanted to marry a senator, like, get my way up that way, but now I, I want to be a baroness. Yeah, and then you can have von something in your Ooh. name. Ooh. Oh, no, no, we're not bringing him up. So she she marries a baron, and she'll never, she'll call herself baroness a lot of times, but she'll never do it in front of, like, actual elected officials or monarch officials, like queens and royalty. She'll never do it in front of those. But in front of lay people, she's always baroness. So much so that I'm always going to call her baroness just because that's what everyone in the Galapagos was calling her. Mm -hmm. So by 1930, she's married to Basquet, who's a French officer, and she's living in Paris. Now, uh, the Baroness, she's not a very pretty girl. She's, one one source called her peroxided, which I'm just calling bleached out. <laughs> she's got buck teeth, another one's calling her horse face. Oh my god. Um, she's got a, she's buxom, let's call it, call it that. I mean, she's gotta do something to get that Baron. Yeah, so she's buxom, but she's also got this, like, gift of gab and this gift of charm, where she can kind of charm people for the short, at least for the short term. And it works in her favor more often than not. 
So she's, I don't, like, obviously that's why she's been married four times and divorced four times, because the the short game she's good in, but the lasting time, her lies are going to be seen through. Anyway, while she's married to Bosque, Bosque's mother has been introducing her to these two German. And just for the sake of keeping stories in line, I'm always going to use... Two German what? Two, two German men. Oh, okay. And just for the sake of um, consistency, I'm always going to use last names. So we've got Lorenz and Philipson. They're two Germans. Philipson is younger than Lorenz. And her mother-in-law is... Her mother-in-law introduces her to these these men because she doesn't want her with her son. Oh. So, you know, this this was her She's final like, marriage. She's like, I know you're a whore. Come on, here you go. Yeah. <laughs> and eventually, Bosque... Er, yeah, Bosque does divorce the Baroness. And she ends up kind of moving in with a, Lorenz and Philipson. So much so that she now begins working at Lorenz's shop. He owns this small little trinket shop in Paris. Now we've got her with these two, and it's kind of like three's company, and she's spending everyone's money. Okay. So she'll take people out for long, or like women's shopping sprees on Lorenz's bill, and eventually starts bankrupting the business that Lorenz has. Yeah, he just has a small business. He's not like a baron yeah, or anything. It's, it's, not even like, it's just like a little trinket shop, just a small odds and ends store. But um, let's just take a side step for a second. This is 1930s. During the 1930s, there's going to be three different groups of people. There's uh, the Baroness and her two men. There's going to be the Ritter couple. I thought we were in Paris. There are, but hang tight for a second. I'm just going to introduce, we're going to have three different groups of people. We're going to have the Baroness and her three people, or her two men. We're going to have the Ritter family and we're going to have the Whitmer family. Okay. And they're all going to kind of reach each other in the Galapagos. But in the 1930s, we have this German doctor, Dr. Ritter. He and his partner, um, Dore, are very, very sick and tired of the hustle and bustle of the world. So this Dr. Ritter, he's a dentist. He removes all his teeth and puts in fake dentures. Okay. Just rips out all his teeth and puts in wood teeth. At this time, the Ecuadorian government is starting to do another push for colonization of the Galapagos Islands. They're offering at least free land, if not some money, and, and like the trip over to the Galapagos. Hell yeah, I'd move somewhere tropical if you're going to give me some land and money. And that's exactly what Ritter's thinking. He's like, all right, so we're going to move there. And he and Dora, his partner, is uh, never, they never got married, but they're always partner. They end up moving to the Galapagos, and they're like, oh, we're going to live here. And they're vegetarian... You know, they're naturalists. They're basically the first people who ever did CrossFit and had a vegan diet. Oh, God. I bet um, they never stopped talking about it either. That's exactly what I've got every single time they're brought up. It's that they're always, you know, vegans and, and very vegetarian. Is that always the second line to their, like, this is their names and they were vegan? And nudists. <laughs> but the, you have to make, there's, um... So well, they if you're going to be vegan and have a really good body, you better be a nudist. Right. They move over to the Galapagos and they find out that the only way to really survive is by having like hip high boots because there's all these low lying thorns and rocks and it's not a very easy terrain to walk on. So they have hip thigh boots and it's so fucking hot that they're naked. <laughs> but that's like, and that's one of the, um, it's like wearing assless chaps and nothing else. Yeah. It's one of those situations where they're not naked for any spiritual thing. They're just, it's just so fucking hot. It's just so fucking hot. So like. <laughs> That's like Florida in the summer. It's like, it's just so hot. You'll see them called nudists, but then another source just kind of straight, straight up writes, they weren't naked for any spirit. They weren't nude for any spiritual reasons. So they're not nudists. They're just naked. <laughs> and so they're living in the Galapagos naked. And the Baroness, after she starts bankrupting that business I was talking about, she hears about Dr. Ritter and his partner moving to the Galapagos. She hears about the Ecuador situation. So her and Lorenz take out some business loans and jump ship. They just kind of her Phillips and Lorenz just leave Paris and head to the Galapagos. Oh, she without takes paying her back, without paying in. back of their creditors. And the only thing that the store really had, because they kind of like tried to sell everything off, was silk French lingerie. So she, they take all that and they take the money that they owe to creditors and they hop on a boat and head to Ecuador. Obviously, it's going to be a long voyage from Paris to Ecuador. And then they have to wait a month in Ecuador before they can head to the Galapagos just for a boat. Yeah, so nobody's going to be able to come after them for their money. Yeah, no one's going to be coming after them for their money very quickly. So while she's heading out there, there's the Ritters are out there and the Whitmers had already traveled out there. Now, the Whitmers are kind of the most boring group here. They're this couple, Arthur and Margaret, 
And they're just kind of normal people living in the Galapagos. And they're like white bread who just wanted to retire and have a nice life. Exactly. So one of the sources I was reading had just said that the Whitmers are that normal family in a random sitcom beyond this craziness. Because this whole situation in the Galapagos was very big in the in the US media. You've got the free love of the Baroness and just her craziness, the nudists of the Ritters, and then you've got the Whitmers. And there's like these three major groups that are living on this one island called Charles Island, presumably named after Charles Darwin. Anyway, the Baroness takes her two men and mail for the Ritters and Whitmers and heads over the Galapagos. And of course, while she's on the boats, she's reading all the mail. So she's already kind of pissed off the Whitmers at least. Oh my God. She just like, she's like, I'll bring their mail. And then the whole time she's just she's opening just reading it and it. reading it. Yeah. And then, you know, so already she's gotten, um, and then she arrives and she's like, here you go. And they're like, the yeah. fuck? She's already pissed them off by reading their <laughs> mail. And then apparently it's just a, a little anecdote. So who knows, but all these stories get t- to be tall tales with the Baroness. She has Lorenz wash her feet in the spring that the Whitmers are drinking out of. So she's not doing well with the Whitmers oh, at all. Oh, man. And once they get to the island, though, the Baroness and her two men have this grand idea to make a luxury hotel on this island. And they're going to be calling this hotel the Hacienda Paradiso. And they're hoping to make a luxury hotel, market to the Americans, bring them down here, and you know, basically ruin the paradise you've just been given. Right. So, you know, the thing is, a lot of the Americans, they're starting to hear the stories of the free love and the nudism and just the weird hedonism of the Galapagos. So they're coming down on these yacht cruises. And this is 1930s. So they're coming down on these yachts and they're making the Galapagos a port of call. I'm going to step into that in a second. But this hotel, it was finished. It becomes a one-room corrugated shack with heavy carpet for the wit- for the walls. Okay, you can't call that a hotel. I'm not. Call- I mean, it's what she's calling it, and <laughs> she's calling it the hotel. She moves in there with her two competing lovers, and like I said, Philipson is the younger one, and he eventually starts becoming favored by the Baroness, mostly because Lorenz is attacked by everyone's favorite disease that's on this podcast: tuberculosis. Consumption. Yes. <laughs> so he starts, you know, becoming more weaker, and some weird twist happens where Philipson starts like. Almost, there's reports of him like beating Lorenz. Like people will hear Lorenz screaming at night because Phillips is just beating out on him. I guess. What? I I don't know. It's something that I don't really have too much about. But people would come by and they'd hear Lorenz kind of moaning and screaming. And nobody nobody comes and helps this guy. Just some guy screaming his like bloody murder in a one room shack covered in fucking carpet. Yeah. No one really wants to deal with them. But also, it's probably because of the Baroness. So she's using, you know, she's this like larger, she's this crazy, crazy woman. And, um, like I heard you wanting to be nice there and be like, she's just a big character. But then you're like, no, this bitch crazy. No, she's just (laughs) like, you know, so here's how, here's her level of normal. So she's wearing silk French lingerie as her swimsuits, right? She also is running this fucking island like it's her own goddamn playground. And the Ritters and the Whitmers cannot stand her. She's walking around in like, Riding boots, riding pants. She's got uh, like a bull whip in one hand, and a pistol on the other, and a belt, you know, a gun belt. And she's just kind of like running around and terrorizing people. Yeah, because what the else is she? There's nothing she's on bored, that island she's to hunt. Her mind, and she's ter- like, no, there's a lot of stuff to hunt. There's everything in the world to hunt. No, and it's, that's the point of the Galapagos is that it, they don't have any. The, this island is different though because there's it's one of the islands that was being colonized and there's goats and shit on it. Oh boy, let's go hunt. So goats. that was an issue. So the Ritters, they're trying to they're vegetarian, they're vegan, they're making their own garden, and they're competing with the local wildlife because like, oh hey, there's food here that's easy to get to. So they're trying to guard their food from the local animals, but they they're doing so with spears. And you've got wild boar. They've got spears and dynamite. And you've got these wi- <laughs> and you've got these wild boar that are coming in. So they're trying to get them away with dynamite and spears. Are you and- sure they're not American? Because that sounds like our logical jump. Like, oh, this spear didn't work. Dynamite. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what it is. They're Germans and they've got dynamite and spears. And um, <laughs> they're Germans. They got dynamite and spears. <laughs> and the spears aren't working against wild boar, but the dynamite is. Well, <laughs> is kind of because it's exploding and loud, and the boars are like, "Fuck that shit." We're not going to go over there. We just That's not where we go, Simba. <laughs> um, while the Baroness is out there, you know, you've got people exploding boards. you get got the Baroness running around with guns. And then you also have the Baroness, like, greeting anyone who's showing up on this island. 
you know, she starts claiming herself as the empress of the island and the pirate king of the, of the Pacific. Oh my god. And um, she has this, like, weird, larger-than-life situation where people are showing up, and she's got Philipson, her, like, younger lover, whom she always calls Baby. You know, and he's, like, massaging her hands while she's talking to these people, arranging cushions, and she's reciting her tale of her life and, and the tall tales that she makes up for herself, being empress of the entire Pacific, um, having a pirate <laughs> fleet, even declaring war on Ecuador because she's just crazy. You know, she's super normal. And this is what she tells to all the people that are coming in. So all the Americans that are showing up at the Galapagos are taking these stories and going back home. And putting it all in the newspaper and saying the newspaper this crazy bitch just said she's the empress of like And that's sending more islands. people back down. So you've got the nudists of the Ritters, you've got the craziness of the Baroness, and then you've got the Whitmers. People are, Americans are coming down and they're giving food and supplies. Shit, I'll provide the food for the circus. Let's go. And most of it's going to the Whitmers and the Baroness and the Ritters are, or the Ritters and the Baroness and the Whitmers, the normal family, they're kind of getting the shaft into the stick, but they're doing all right. They're just kind of like living and being like, what the fuck is going on? We just wanted to retire. <laughs> now the Whitmers weren't necessarily favored by the Ritters. Um, the do- the dentist, he just wanted to be on his own. Like they were called the Adam and Eve of the Galapagos. Um, Dr. Ritter and his partner. So that's why people are coming down, and now you've got the Whitmers, and it kind of spoiled everything. But they both had a shared hatred of the Baroness. Yeah, you said or, you already said that everybody hates her. Yeah, but they actually called the governor of the Galapagos Islands to deal with her, because she's running around with a bullwhip and a pistol, and is now a pirate king. Come deal with this shit. So the governor shows up, and he's there for a little bit of time, But instead of telling her to stop and go away, he actually grants her a title of of land. Oh, my God. And disappears on vacation with her for a number of weeks. (laughs) So, like I said, she has this charm of the ages, apparently, and even charms his governor into giving her land. I don't know what those horse teeth do, but some people (laughs) like it. We'll put up pictures on the Instagram and on Facebook, and she's, it's not necessarily super buck teeth, but she's got big teeth. I mean, I don't think I could talk the governor of Ecuador into running away with me for a few weeks. No, and, you know, something something about her gift of gab allowed her to do that. You know, and like I said, she's also meeting these yacht and ship owners and captains and just getting all this, all these goods that she needs. Now, um, you know, that's just kind of like the craziness of this island. That's just what's been going on for a few months. Or, you know, a few months into a few years. By 1934, Lorenz, the uh, the lover of hers, that's the older man who has tuberculosis. Yeah, who's he's, been dying. He's somehow surviving, and he ends up running away from the Paradiso, their little hotel, to the Whitmers. And the Whitmers kind of take him in. They let him live in the house, in like the, the animal house. I thought they didn't like him. They didn't, but they like the Baroness less, and Lorenz doesn't like the Baroness anymore either because he's fallen out of favor with her. And he's getting his ass whooped every night. Yeah, and so him. he moves into in with them for protection. You know, for the next few weeks, he's just kind of like people are looking for him, and he's just doing odd and end jobs, kind of helping like maintain the land of the Whitmers. Okay. And maintain their fences and stuff like that. Now we've got it going kind of a little bit quicker. So the Baroness shows up. She's looking for Lorenz. It takes her a few days. She's, she's, she's looking for Lorenz. She approaches the Whitmer's house and is like, hey, have you seen Lorenz? We have a ship coming. We're going to go to Tahiti. We're going to leave the Galapagos and go to the South Sea Islands. And we want it, all three of us. And Whitmer hears this because he's like hiding behind, like the way it's written. Lorenz is, hears it? Lorenz hears this. He's he, hiding behind the fence essentially. But Margaret Whitmer is talking to the Baroness about this. And she's like, oh, no, we haven't seen, we haven't seen Lorenz. And Lorenz, he, he kind of feels like it's a trap. So he's not going to go find the Baroness right away. Yeah, because he knows she doesn't have any money. Yeah, but she has the ability to kind of like con, con people. anybody into anything. So he, he waits like two or three days. And then he ha- heads over to the hotel. And two days later, he comes back reporting like, hey, they're gone. But she's like left a lot of her like favorite items here. But her and Philipson are gone. There's no trace of them. They've been gone for a few days. They haven't come back. So he starts spending his next the next few weeks at the hotel. I'm using air quotes here, everybody. The one room shack with carpeting. The, the one room shack with carpets for walls. He spends the next few weeks there and returns to the Whitmers for dinner and, and meals. Just kind of taking care of everything. And he keeps going out to Post Office Bay, which is where the, a lot of the ships will come through. 
and he's trying to find he's trying to flag down a ship we don't necessarily know where he's going he's just trying to flag down a ship probably to get back out of the galapagos and back to germany is what everyone's assuming he doesn't even he eventually does find a ship there's this norwegian fishing captain that lives outside the galapagos and to me you get norway on the north pacific or north atlantic which is frozen and full of vikings and you get the galapagos which is tropical and full of turtles i don't know why there's norwegian fishermen in the galapagos but there is. They're fishermen. They can be anywhere they want to be. Yeah. Anyway, he ends up picking up on her ship, on this ship with his captain, and disappearing. And everyone's like, okay, so now all three of the Baroness's people are gone. We can kind of relax a little bit. Now, Ritter, the do- the doctor, the nudist doctor, he's super elated that the Baroness is gone. Yeah, this is like a prayer come true. Right. You know, and he only has like, you know, he's excited that the Baroness is gone. But the time that we're at now, the Galapagos having a huge drought. And obviously, he and his his partner are both vegetarians. So if you have a drought, you're not growing vegetables. And they have to change their diet up. And they start hunting with the help of the Whitmers. And Ritter has only had, like, a few months of his time on this island being at peace. Yeah, and, without the Baroness running around and telling everybody that she's in control. Yeah, without the Baroness. And then... You know, he and the Whitmers are kind of like starting to become a little bit more friendly with each other, so much so that the Whitmers help them hunt because they've just been eating vegetables and like plants. And Ritter actually starts getting sick because he ate something. It's traced back to a spoiled rabbit. And apparently he and Dore had both eaten from this rabbit. But Dr. Ritter had been getting sicker and sicker, starting paralysis in his legs. Oh, man. And he eventually passes away. And it takes a few days until the paralysis takes effect that his partner starts reporting it to people and trying to get help. His last words are, you know, that he is very angry at Dore. He's very pissed off at her. So people are like... Why? It's not her fault. Apparently they had a falling out sometime after the Baroness had left. And she had eaten from the same rabbit, but she wasn't getting sick. So, oh, so he thought she was killing him. People, yeah, it's it's down to either Dore or Margaret had poisoned Dr. Ritter. And we don't really know who or why. This whole area of the Galapagos, this is where things go from like, all right, the Baroness disappeared, now everyone's kind of happy. And it goes down really quickly. I guess they had a falling out. So with him getting sick and her not getting sick, the doctor's smart enough to blame the woman who also ate from the rabbit, thinking that maybe she poisoned him or gave him spoiled food or something. So he dies, and now we just have Dore, the Whitmers, on this island. It's 1934, and another vessel comes through on our scientific research cruise. They're trying to update a lot of what Darwin had done. They're looking at the animals, taking collection of animals to bring back to the United States. They're meeting with the Whitmers. They're meeting with um, Dore, and they had stopped on one island nearby. Now, we have all the Baroness. She's disappeared. Her and her two men have disappeared. By the time this vessel shows up, they come across an island where they find Lorenz's body dead and desiccated on an island where there's enough food, but there's no fresh water at all on this island. Lorenz didn't even go with them. He left with the Norwegian. Yeah, and they found this Norwegian fishing boat crash on this island and two bodies, one being Lorenz and one definitely being the fishermen. Oh, man. Desiccated and dead on this island. There was food, but there, there wasn't any water, and we're in a drought season. We're not in a wet season. We're in dry, so there's no rainwater coming down to keep them alive. Yeah. You know, and they had time to set up a, um, a small signal flag to try to flag to the other island that, hey, we're in shipwreck here. By the time a ship should have arrived at Tahiti, there's no sign of the Baroness. And she's this woman who, like I said, she was either a spy or a secretary, She was running trinket shops to bankruptcy, married four times, telling tales of how she's she's wild. She's wild, and she never pops back up. Yeah, somebody would have seen her. Somebody would have like known. So the odds of her arriving in Tahiti and becoming a boring reserve person are very, very slim. What happened to her? That's what becomes the big issue. Now, Mrs. Whitmer, Margaret, and Dore are both meeting with this ship that comes through. So much so that they take Dore back to Germany after Dr. Ritter dies, and she ends up publishing some stuff in in, um, magazines about her time in the Galapagos and the craziness of the Baroness. But Margaret is convinced that Lorenz actually had been spending time. He, He went out at night to the hotel and must have killed the Baroness and Philipson. 
and then burn their bodies because there's never a sign again of the Baroness. So she had left all her prized possessions at the hotel and it wouldn't have made sense for her to leave like her favorite things on the Galapagos if she was moving to Tahiti. They don't have much. They, they're living in a one-room shack. You can take everything you own in a backpack. Yeah, but this is like some like sick, almost crippled guy. I mean, he's got tuberculosis. He's got tuberculosis. And I mean, this other man's been whooping his ass every night. You think he could just suddenly show up and so kill them? So Margaret is thinking that, sh- that he disappeared at night. Over like It's not a very far area to go. Like Everyone knows each other and they know where everything is. So he must have gone over at night, waited for the Baroness and Philipson to um, go to sleep and then killed them. And then spends the next few days with dead bodies. I don't know. I'm assuming cutting them up and throwing them in the fire and just burning the bodies, destroying any evidence that he killed these people because the Baroness never pops up on the radar again. Yeah, but some boat was supposed to pick her up. Don't you think a boat picking her up would have noticed when she didn't show up? Or she could have lied. She could have lied to try to get Lorenz back so she can have both her men. So, you know, it's it's a possibility that she could have lied to... You know, then he's he's done with this bullshit. So he sees through the lie. He sees through the lie, sees an opportunity to get rid of the Baroness and her other lover and takes it out of revenge of these beatings, which makes the most amount of sense to me. And then he was trying to jump ship to get off this island, but maybe he wanted a job and that's why he went with the fishing boat as opposed to any boat that was traveling further. They get shipwrecked on an island out in the water. There's no way for them to make a signal to the other island, which doesn't have any boats anyway. Guess and karma's a bitch, huh? Exactly. <laughs> and then, like I said, Dora is the only one who gets out of here perfectly fine. She gets out, heads back to Germany, and starts writing journal articles. And the Whitmers, they just kind of disappear because they're they're the most, like I said, they're the most sane. They're the All most... they wanted was a quiet little place to settle down. Yeah, they're the most sane, so they're the, the most boring. So they may have just stayed on the Galapagos Islands, but by the time the um, the ship who was doing the sail in the, the 34 had left, she dropped off the face of the world. And you have, like, the crazy island of, the, of Charles Island and the Galapagos with the nudists and the free love triangle, and then everyone dying under mysterious circumstances. Because the reports from one doctor who arrived on the island is saying that it could have been an aneurysm that killed Dr. Ritter, or it could have been poisoning. And then there's only a few people on this island, so who's poisoning who, and why is everyone dying? So it's just the... The island of death and the Baroness de Risky. And that's what it is. And people are actually, there's actually these rumors too that the Galapagos tortoises are so long live and they can kind of bring a curse onto people. And Did I ever tell you I wanted one? No, no. No, I really, really want one and I want it to be like a family heirloom. Yeah. Like a living family heirloom. So like for the next like 150 years, like someone has to take care of this fucking turtle if they want to get any of like the riches. Oh, his name's Frank. That's terrible. <laughs> um, you know, and then because of, it could have, like, there's no real beginning to when this story happened, but obviously it's in the 30s or so when, like, locals are trying to bring up this information about the curse, and they're wondering if maybe it has to do with this Charles Island incident. Because you have these, like, No, the and... turtles did not cause the death of no, a baroness. No, 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 but the, the, the myth of them being cursed animals could have come from this, because you've got... <laughs> Dr. Ritter dying under extreme circumstances, and you've got the Baroness disappearing, both her lovers being, well, at least one disappearing, one being dead. And this is the story of Charles Island. I was trying to start off with just the Baroness, but everybody on this fucking island <laughs> is crazy. It's just the most strange posi- strange place of all time. I learned two new things today. I learned if you were funny looking, you have special powers of protection, and uh, that turtles... No, tortoises can bring on curses. Yeah, apparently. (laughs) So that's what's going on in the Galapagos Islands. And now, you know, they're at varying states of colonization and no one living there anymore. But you've got a lot of ecotourism. So there are people living in the Galapagos nowadays. And the people always taking tours there because there are these beautiful islands. But it's kind of hard to live there in the 1930s when you have carpet and nothing to build an actual hotel out of. And a crazy bitch running around washing your feet and your drinking water. Washing your feet and drinking water and carrying a revolver around and hitting on every pirate or every ship captain that shows up and telling them that she's a pirate and the emperor of the fucking Pacific Ocean. (laughs) So that's the story of the Baroness de Basquet. And Charles Island and the crazy free love hippie nudist colony that was once there. Wow, that's awesome. I didn't realize that existed in like 1930. No, I didn't realize just kind of how crazy it was. 
But that's going to do it for us here because that was our... Gone up in smoke type of people. Yeah. And I so. uh, hope that, I don't know, maybe we'll inspire someone to go figure it out. Go find out what happened to the Duchess and, no, the Baroness. The Baroness de Risky and let us know. Yeah, so she hasn't popped up again, and that's what I was trying to find, but she just disappears off the face of the world. But uh, as a final night before we go, I wanted to mention something. I was thinking about doing a new little special to add on to these episodes, and so I was thinking maybe once a month we could do a special extra episode of people's snafu stories. So maybe people could be writing into us and tell us your most fucked up situation that's ever happened to you like what's that story you tell at every party that people are like no freaking way yeah the ones that no one's ever gonna believe in that probably please don't tell them like they're a dream <laughs> yeah no don't like like make something up and at the end and be like no it was really all fake but yeah i think that would be fun like write us tell us your snafu story and at the end of the month we will read it and give you a shout out what do you guys think so if you guys are into that, just kind of message us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, or you can send an email to snafoodpodcast at gmail.com, and Shan and I will go through, read them, and then we'll prop up an episode about those. Yeah, if we get enough, we'll start doing that. I think that there's more than enough of you out there with some crazy story to tell. Everyone has a crazy story. You just <laughs> need to make sure that we hear it so we can tell everybody about it. Oh, man. But until next time, thanks for hanging in there with us. And please uh, go subscribe, review, and leave us a five-star review if you get the opportunity. It means all the world to us. So thank you guys again. And I just want to do another shout-out to Hanu Dixit, who is the one who starred our intro music. I want to make sure that we kind of constantly let people know that that wasn't a creation of our own. And this podcast can't be done just on our own. So thank you for all... Thank you all for listening because it means the world to us. Yeah, you guys are great. Have a good night, everybody. Bye. (laughs)